An ad agency in New York cooked up a novel way to advertise themselves to potential clients. They mailed a top executive at each firm a stuffed toy and a ransom note. The words, cut out of magazines and newspapers in classic ransom note style, read, We're holding your kid for ransom. We have their favorite stuffed animal. Signed, The Kidnappers. One executive passed his note on to the FBI, who investigated the ad agency and found that they weren't kidnappers. Just dumb. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. Welcome to an especially cringe-inducing episode of our randomly appearing series, We Can't Have Nice Things. Marketing is an absolutely inescapable force in our lives. You'd probably have an easier time avoiding water than avoiding advertising. Digital advertising alone is a 120 billion with a B dollar business each year. But a fair chunk of that money goes down the tubes thanks to marketing fails. Just like perennial favorite Elmer McCurdy from episode 63, Well-Traveled Bodies, let's kick off today's episode with a story that makes every such list. The Moonanites. For those not in the know, the Moonanites are secondary characters on the Adult Swim show Aqua Teen Hunger Force. If all of that sounds like nonsense to you, that's because it is, and I'm saying that as someone who never missed an episode. The Moonanites are crude, 8-bit-style characters, often seen flipping a low-res bird. At around 8 a.m. on January 31st, 2007, a passenger at a bus depot in Boston noticed a suspicious object stuck to a steel girder underneath Interstate 93 and reported it to authorities. Northbound traffic on I-93 and Orange Line trains were delayed for more than an hour during the height of rush hour. Two hours later, officials detonated the object. Even though investigators determined the object wasn't a bomb, they weren't exactly sure what it was, calling it some kind of hoax device. The hoax device turned out to be an LED sign of a Moonanite character that was part of a larger guerrilla marketing campaign for the Aqua Teen Hunger Force movie. There were actually 40 such signs already hung up at the behest of an ad agency by two local artists, and they hadn't raised any fuss. After the one sign was detonated, the artists were found and arrested. At a later press conference, when reporters tried to ask how they felt about causing such a panic, the pair refused to answer any questions not related to haircuts of the 70s. The story became national news with the apparent overreaction of Boston authorities getting more press than the Aqua Teen movie ever would. By the afternoon of the incident, Turner Broadcasting, the parent company of Cartoon Network, publicly accepted responsibility for the stunt and later agreed to pay $2 million to the agencies involved in the response, with half of that going to Homeland Security and other related programs. What all agencies were involved in neutralizing the threat that was basically a light bright the ATF, FBI, Federal Protective Services, the Secret Service, Massachusetts State Police, Federal Park Police, and the Transit Police. The head of Cartoon Network resigned a week later, and the artists got away with a plea deal for community service. A California agency figured the best way to most people's hearts is through their stomachs, so they decided to woo potential clients with donuts. Not at all a bad idea. Unless you decide that the best way to get those donuts into the hands of people who might want your services is to mail them. The prospective clients were understandably unimpressed by the proposals that arrived in their office with a box of smashed, moldy donuts. That's two ad agency foul-ups in the first page of this script. Maybe that's why Chevrolet decided to let the public write their ad for them. When General Motors teamed up with NBC's The Apprentice to promote the Chevy Tahoe in March of 2006, someone had a brilliant idea. Why not let viewers build their own commercials on the web? Promotional spots on the show directed viewers to a now-defunct website where they could build ads using GM-supplied videos and music, but had apparent free reign to add their own text. Instead of loving tributes to the Tahoe, 
Hundreds of videos appeared portraying the Tahoe as a gas-guzzling, safety-challenged environmental disaster. After a couple weeks of such abuse, GM scrubbed the videos from its site, but many of them are still on YouTube. And yes, they're linked in the show notes. If your app doesn't do links in the show notes, tag me on social media. I'm at Facebook and Instagram slash YourBrainOnFacts and Twitter at BrainOnFactsPod. Chevrolet also misfired with a 2000 campaign for the Blazer, which showed their SUV attached to the side of a ship in place of one of its lifeboats. The problem? Chevy's tagline is, like a rock, which is the last thing you want in a lifeboat. Drivers are pretty used to car companies bragging about their safety features, usually by showing cool, slow-mo test crash footage. But Hyundai decided to go a different direction with things, and claim their car's low emissions as a safety feature. They ran a TV commercial in the UK showing a man getting into the Hyundai iX35 crossover in a garage, rolling down the windows, starting the car, trying to kill himself. The attempt was unsuccessful because the crossover didn't produce enough toxic emissions. The backlash was immediate and severe. Hyundai Motors Europe issued a statement that said in part, We are very sorry if we have offended anyone. We have taken the video down and have no intention in using it in any of our advertising or marketing. The popular car website Jalopnik gave the ad the dubious distinction of worst car ad in history. In the mid-1990s, Fiat wanted to do something big to get buzz going around their new Cinquecento, The ad agency they hired decided to send anonymous letters to 50,000 women. Each letter was personally addressed to the recipient and began with a flurry of compliments. Then came an invitation to have a little adventure after We met again on the street yesterday and I noticed how you glanced interestedly in my direction. It's like if a terrible Craigslist misconnection came to your home address. Local papers reported that many women felt threatened by the letters. Some women chose to stay home for a few days, worried that they were actually being stalked. Other women had undoubtedly awkward and confusing arguments with their partners, demanding to know who this mystery man was. The mystery was solved a few days later when the agency sent out a second letter identifying the admirer as the new Fiat Cinquecento. Fiat cancelled the campaign and apologized after widespread criticism from the public and from consumer protection advocates. Ford's branch in India wanted to showcase the amount of trunk space that the hatchback Figo had. What better way to do that than by showing how many celebrities you can put in the back? The ad campaign featured a series of cartoon celebrities, including Paris Hilton and the Cardassians, tied up in the back of the Ford Figo with the tagline, Leave Your Worries Behind. One version of the ad even featured then-Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi driving with three scantily clad women, bound and gagged in the back. Ford HQ stepped in, shut down the ad, and immediately began issuing apologies. Back in the 80s, Ford launched the Aerostar minivan and decided to have some fun with the design of the van as well as its name. In the 80s, everyone was talking about NASA missions and looking toward the stars. So Ford decided to capitalize on the popularity and ordered a massive campaign that compared the Aerostar to the Space Shuttle. This time, the marketing fail was one of timing. The campaign was launched in 1986, the same year as the Challenger explosion. Bonus fact, Carol Spinney, the man who puppeted beloved Sesame Street denizen Big Bird for nearly 50 years, was almost on the Challenger. Luckily for him, though tragically for teacher Krista McAuliffe, the giant costume would have been a logistical nightmare in the space shuttle. Bad timing can easily ruin an otherwise good ad campaign. With hope to evoke the proud emotions of accomplishment, satisfaction, and dedication after an athletic achievement, Adidas sent out congratulatory emails to its customer base, including participants of the Boston Marathon after the race. The email message read, Congrats! You survived the Boston Marathon. You know, the Boston Marathon, 
that was hit by a terrorist attack in 2013 that killed three people and injured more than 260. People who got the email screen-capped it and blasted Adidas on social media. Airbnb launched their Floating World marketing campaign, which included an image of a water-themed house sitting on the surface of the water. The copy included phrases like, Stay above water and Live the life aquatic with these floating homes. Everything would have been fine, except this campaign launched on August 28, 2017, when Hurricane Harvey was engulfing Houston. Frito-Lay decided to set aside their spokes feline Chester Cheetah and try something a little edgy. The Orange Underground site featured a deliberately scratchy video urging viewers to commit random acts of Cheetos. Coat your fingers with Cheetos and leave your mark on someone's back, someone's desk, wherever you like. It encouraged visitors to fill people's shoes with Cheetos, crush them inside someone's laptop, or toss them in the dryer with someone else's laundry, and then naturally post videos of their dirty deeds online. The company set up a blog, created a YouTube channel, took out full-page ads in USA Today, and even assigned a minion to troll the blogosphere and post comments using the screen name Cheeto1. Fortunately for the world's laundry, almost no one noticed the Orange Underground campaign. Online brand consultant John Icke counted a grand total of 17 blogs talking about the campaign a month after it launched. Speaking of trying to be edgy, middling R&B singer Ashanti's people thought it would be a keen idea to advertise her new album, The Declaration, with fake death threats that fans could make through her website. CNN reporter Lola Oganaki received one and described it like this. I received a really disturbing email one afternoon. Do you know the person pictured in the following video? It read, If so, please contact me immediately. Your life may be in danger. The sender claimed to be Detective James Nicholas, Director of Crime Prevention for the Universal Crime Network. It's not every day that I get death threats, so naturally I freaked, clicked on the link, and up popped a news report about a series of copycat murders that had been inspired by the R&B singer Ashanti's video, The Way That I Love You, a song about a woman who discovers her boyfriend has been unfaithful. Clutching a butcher knife and dressed in a beaded gown, she cries and croons about betrayal. The cheater ends up dead in a bathtub. Jealous lovers, according to the report, were on a rampage, and the next victim it suggested would be me. On the walls of one of the crime scenes were the words, Lola will die, written in what appeared to be blood. Yikes. How this was supposed to sell albums, I don't know. Neither did the record label, apparently, either. The declaration sold 80,000 copies on its release a far cry from the 400,000 copies that her debut had sold in its first week six years earlier. Toyota's Your Other You ad campaign for the 2009 Matrix was supposed to capitalize on the punking trend popular at the time, but the punk was on the other foot when they found themselves being sued for $10 million in damages by one of the victims. In the summer of 2008, a woman named Amber Duick began receiving emails from a man calling himself Sebastian Bowler, who appeared to be a thuggish, beer-chugging British soccer hooligan. In the emails, Bowler told Duick he was driving across the U.S. and needed to lay low at her place for a while, following some unpleasantness at a motel that involved the smashing of a TV. He told Duick he'd arrive in a couple of days and made it clear that he had her home address. Duick subsequently received an email from the manager of the aforementioned motel, along with an invoice for the broken television, arguing that she was responsible for the cost. Naturally, Duick was as frightened as she was confused. Eventually, another email came in, pointing her to a video explaining that it was all a prank, but by then, the damage had been done. Duick hired a lawyer and slapped Toyota, their ad agency, and 50 other named individuals with a $10 million lawsuit for infliction of emotional distress, unfair, unlawful, and deceptive trade practices, and negligent misrepresentation, among other things. Toyota tried to have the lawsuit dismissed and moved to arbitration, arguing that Ms. Duick agreed, 
to the whole prank when she clicked on their terms of service agreement, which included an arbitration clause. The Court of Appeals of California rejected this argument, stating there was no way a reasonable person could tell what she had signed up for or consented to. Unfortunately, that's the very last thing I could find about this case. If you ever see any more about it, or even one example of where encouraging people to prank their friends as a way to sell your product actually works, do let me know, because I can't find any. It's the kind of interesting fact that would be really good to post in the Brainiac's break room. That is the Facebook group which is open to everyone who loves sharing interesting facts. Just go over to facebook.com slash groups, plural, slash Brainiac break room. There are far more examples of ad campaigns leading to lawsuits. In July of 2008, Taco Bell created an ad asking rapper 50 Cent, real name Curtis Jackson, to change his name to 79 cent, 89 cent, or 99 cent for one day to promote their cheaper menu items. In exchange for the one day name change, Taco Bell offered to donate $10,000 to a charity of his choice. Sounds like a good deal, right? Curtis Jackson didn't think so. In fact, he didn't know about the offer until it went out. After the ad was released without his knowledge, the rapper filed a lawsuit against the fast food company for using his name without his permission. Apparently, Taco Bell had sent a joke letter to news outlets requesting the name change without first even running it by Curtis Jackson. For simply mentioning his name in an ad, Taco Bell was slapped with a $4 million lawsuit and lost. Taco Bell was forced to pay an undisclosed amount in a settlement to Curtis Jackson for misleading his fans into thinking he was selling out as a paid endorser. Sometimes the wasted money and backlash from advertising comes not from what a company does, as much as for the fact that they decided to do something new at all. In Christmas 2011, Coca-Cola released white cans to raise awareness and funds to create a safe haven for polar bears. However, some consumers found the white cans to be too similar to the silver Diet Coke cans. Consumers with diabetes complained they were accidentally buying the sugary version rather than the sugar-free version. The white cans were removed and the red cans brought back in immediately. Red Coke cans take tradition to a whole new level. In Coca-Cola's 125 years of existence, the company has never changed a can color once it's been issued. Logo redesign and rebranding for corporations isn't cheap. Companies pay firms millions of dollars for new designs, though it probably would have been easier and faster to just take that money out to the parking lot and burn it. The Gap's iconic logo was the same from 1986 to 2016, but for six long days in October 2010, Gap swapped their typeface to Sans Serif Helvetica and transformed the navy blue background to a small blue gradient box. Buzz began to reverberate around the designer community, quietly sniggering at the new Gap logo. Soon, the internet was alive with activity, and it was clear that people did not like the new design. The Gap rebrand was estimated to have cost them $100 million. Not the price tag you'd expect to see for something that you could have put together with word art. They definitely didn't get a good value. You know what I value? The members at patreon.com slash yourbrainonfacts that help me to cover the very real costs of putting on this podcast and the new show, Science with Savannah, age 7, which will hopefully very soon, when the technical difficulties are ironed out, be available as its very own separate podcast. So I owe great thanks to our members, Troy, Seth, Sean, Ryan, Adam, Nathan, Michael, Dan, Council of Geeks, Baron and Amber. And one of our members sent me the most wonderful message after last week's episode about the Stonewall Riots and Gay Pride. At the end of the episode, I gave a little shout out to my transgender and non-gender conforming friends and later received this message from a listener. Your sign-off this week was so tender and sweet that I actually cried. I'm being totally honest. It hit me out of nowhere. The episode was so powerful, and unlike most of the self-serving pride stuff you hear about this time of year, those stories you told were very moving, 
and when you sent your wishes out to your friends, I just burst into tears. I had my custom earbuds in so I could hear you very well, and I think it's because I could detect genuine emotion in your voice. Anyway, I wanted to share this with you. You literally made someone cry with your podcast. In a good way. I think that's pretty cool. And I think it's pretty cool too. And I thank each and every one of you who sends me a message on social media or through email. And you can always send a message through the bottom of our website at yourbrainonfacts.com. Dove Beauty Products had had a good thing going with the Positive Body Image Real Beauty campaign featuring real women of various shapes, sizes, and skin tones. The campaign has actually been running for 15 years and is widely noted as one of the most successful marketing campaigns ever. But... In the UK, Dove released limited edition packaging designed to present diverse representation of female bodies. It sounds clever, but basically it's just shampoo bottles with different curves. Women didn't appreciate having their bodies compared to abstract bottles. Instead of reinforcing a strong body image, it ended up increasing self-consciousness, as there were only a few different figures available. In the same year, Dove ran an ad on Facebook showing a four-panel image of a young African-American woman removing her shirt over the course of the first three panels, and the fourth panel showing a young white woman. It wasn't a mistake, it was what they were going for. If you Google racist Dove ad, it pops right up. Dove said the ad was intended to show the diversity of real beauty. And in their defense, there were other similar four panels with different combinations of women. But everyone else interpreted this ad to mean something else. Dove has company. In Nivea's Middle East division, the company posted an ad for their Invisible for Black and White deodorant, which I'm assuming sounds better in a different language. The ad depicted the back of a woman's head with long, dark hair covering her white outfit. The tagline read, White is purity. Obviously, this was interpreted as racially insensitive. Worse for Nivea than the people speaking out against the ad were all the white supremacist groups who jumped at the opportunity to applaud them for it. Nobody was cheering when the Bloomingdale's department store released its Christmas catalog a few years ago. The photo of an attractive, well-dressed woman being eyeballed by a slightly creepy-looking man was innocent enough, until you read the definitely creepy caption, Spike your best friend's eggnog when they're not looking. The internet was in an uproar, with many interpreting the caption to be in support of date rape. Bloomingdale's admitted the ad was in poor taste. Benetton's Unhate campaign, which still exists, had good intentions when it was launched in 2011, and then things immediately got weird. Their posters showed half a dozen world leaders kissing, including China's Hu Jintao and America's Barack Obama. But on one of the images, the Italian clothing company took their Photoshop skills a little too far. They received an official warning and threat of legal action from the Vatican from a totally unacceptable image of Pope Benedict XVI kissing an Egyptian imam, and they subsequently withdrew that ad. The Vatican said in a statement that the ad was damaging not only to the dignity of the Pope and the Catholic Church, but to the feelings of believers. The White House had also disapproved of the ad featuring Barack Obama, but Benetton kept using those. Politics is a dicey way to bring in more customers, especially if people are in the streets protesting their government at the time. Probably not the best time to shoehorn your brand into the conversation. The Kenneth Cole Clothing Company thought the Arab Spring was the ideal platform for social media marketing when they tweeted, Millions are in an uproar in hashtag Cairo. Rumor is they heard our new spring collection is already available online. More than 800 people would be killed in the Egyptian Revolution. Twitter users quickly roasted the company for their insensitivity. Kenneth Cole pulled the tweet and issued an apology. Lesson learned? Nope. Two years later, they put out another insensitive tweet during the crisis in Syria. Boots on the ground or not, let's not forget about sandals, pumps, and loafers 
Hashtag footwear. Oy vey. Now, most of our entries violate social mores or good sense, but EA literally broke the law. The video game company shipped brass knuckles with advanced copies of The Godfather 2 video game to media outlets. Turns out, brass knuckles are illegal in a lot of the states they ship them to. A day late and a dollar short, EA realized that this wasn't their most brilliant idea and had to contact the journalists asking them to send the brass knuckles back. Their incompetence did manage to generate some buzz about the not-so-hotly-anticipated Godfather 2 game, but it still only sold 400,000 copies. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. But don't think you have to be a big business to make big marketing mistakes. A Texas mattress store called Miracle Mattress used 9-11 as a sales theme in an online commercial for their Twin Tower sale. Picture two stacks of mattresses in the background, each with a man standing in front of it, and a woman standing a little in front of them in the center. What better way to remember 9-11 than with a Twin Tower sale? Right now, you can get any size mattress for a twin price. She banters with the men before throwing her arms open triumphantly, sending the men crashing into the twin towers of mattresses. She shatners some panic, then turns back to the camera and, still smirking, says, We'll never forget. Very shortly afterward, the owner closed the store indefinitely. In his apology statement, he said that their best path forward is to reopen the doors as soon as possible, following the hiring of new staff. Thanks for spending part of your day with me. And don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs>